What's up? It's fine, we can actually just do it like this. Like Mr. Jones said, he's uh he does it like this, so it's no big deal. All right, so um first off, thank you everyone. Um it's an honor to be your lecturer today. And um so before I start, uh just one main thing I wanted to kind of tell you all is that look, uh I'm not a real professor. So uh <laughs> what I mean by that is like don't be scared of like asking questions. Uh if I like ask you a question, you know, don't be scared of like answering, because obviously I'm not gonna grade you. So, um, you know, if Mr. Jones grades you, just let me know, because I'll talk to him. He or she shouldn't, but uh, yeah, that's uh, the only main thing I wanted to kind of talk about for now. Um, so yeah, the title of this presentation is called From Chaos to Control, an Introduction to Data Governance and Data Management. And so I really like this title because I think that by the time I'm done with this lecture, it's gonna make a lot of sense as to what I mean exactly from like chaos to control. So before we go ahead and talk about the good stuff, I guess uh, I'll introduce uh, myself to you all. So my name is Seth Sheikh, and um, I obtained my Bachelor's of Information Systems here in May of 2020. And so that was definitely like an interesting time to graduate because uh, if you all remember, that was when the whole COVID-19 pandemic began. And I'll never forget, like I was actually in this building on the first floor uh, in my calculus class. And it was just a few days before spring break was supposed to happen. And we all got the announcement that like, you know, school was gonna be shifting online. And uh, I just was like, I don't know, I thought it was gonna be for like a two week thing. I didn't, you know, obviously as you remember, it was much, much, much longer than that. So uh, yeah, when I was definitely an interesting time to graduate, but fortunately, um, you know, I was able to find a really good job after a couple months of applying. And um, just since then, my whole, uh, I guess, work has been remote. So that's one big takeaway from that time. And yes, as Mr. Jones mentioned, um, I am actually at Georgetown now. I'm doing my master's in technology management, and I hope to uh, finish that program by uh, next spring, so May of 2024. And um, so I've been working in the data management, data governance space for the last three years. So it's a field that I really, really love, and uh, I hope to continue my career down, like just going forward in data governance. So uh, when Mr. Jones actually asked me like if I wanted to come and uh, do a guest lecture, I was like, please say no more. <laughs> I got this. And um, yeah, so I took CIS um, 211 with Mr. Jones uh, during spring of 2018, which uh, I was actually thinking back, that was like five years ago. So um, that's pretty crazy how long time, like, time flies like that. But my, uh, she, I was thinking back about that class and I remember for the final project, I had to do like a, um, a paper and a presentation on like some general topic and uh, like I think just technology. And so I chose to do mine on uh, big data. Remember that Mr. Jones? Yeah. 
Yep. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it was actually pretty funny because like that paper, like doing that, like it, that research for all that, it's kind of what piqued my interest in this particular field because at that time, I didn't really know like a whole lot about like data analytics and you know that particular area. So just doing that, like paper and presentation really got me interested. And then like five years later, I mean, I'm here now. So uh, I guess the whole point is like, if you know, please take your uh, project seriously. Pick a good topic also, because uh, that's really like, if you choose something that you're interested in and you just kind of do more research on, you'll like really kind of dig deeper and you find out more things that you may have not known before. And uh, yeah, you learn a lot. And then lastly, just outside of work, you know, I enjoy just traveling, trying new foods. Uh, just I'm a kind of a gamer these days. So I have a PS5 and uh, a couple months ago, I've been playing God of War. Uh, but these days I'm actually playing Dead Space. So <laughs> great games. But yeah, that's a little bit about me. Now, <clears throat> for today's lecture, a lot of the knowledge that I'll be talking about is gonna be coming from this book over here called the Dimbach or the Data Management Body of Knowledge, as it's more formally known. Now, this page, I mean, this book is like roughly 600 pages long, and it is basically the Bible of like everything pertaining to data strategy. Uh, more specific things like data governance, data management, uh, content and document management, master data management, reference data management, like a lot of different subsets of data governance and data management are all covered in this one book. And it's actually one of those like really popular, like it's used by like many industries, like a lot of uh, companies use the frameworks from this book uh, for their like organization, the way they like do data governance and data management. Uh, so it's an extremely uh, useful book, very just it's jam packed with knowledge. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, if you want, like, really want to get into like, the field of data governance and data management, and you really want to kind of build your credentials up, there's a certification called the CDMP, uh, which is going to be a huge boost to your resume, but it basically kind of covers every, like, most of the chapters from the Dimbach book, and uh, just test your knowledge on a lot of the concepts and frameworks used. So, um, you know, that's actually, I'm kind of studying for that these days, and um, I hope to take that in June. Uh, so I'm like halfway done reading the Dimbach. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of reading as you can imagine. But yeah, so a lot of the information today will be coming from this blue book here. All right, so let's go and talk about data management. So first thing first is that I'm gonna give you like the formal definition from the Dimbach on data management, and then I'm gonna go ahead and like uh, expand on it in the next slide. So I'll just give you guys like a couple seconds <coughs> to read through this. slide. So what exactly is data management? So first off, it is concerned with data as an organizational asset. Now, when you think of the word asset, you know, think of like the most basic definition. Uh, an asset is just something that is like a high value and it can be a personal asset. Like, you know, for example, like my iPhone, you know, that to me is a per like a, an ass asset because it's, it's expensive. And you know, things like my Apple watch, you know, sometimes you might have jewelry, or other like expensive items, those are all your personal assets. And so organizations also have assets, you know, things that are extremely valuable to them. So that's actually kind of like where I want to ask my first question to you all. Um, you know, think of Towson University as an asset, um, or as a you know, organization, which it is. Uh, what are some assets that would be valuable to Towson? Yes. Um, as a university, probably like I'd say, Specific, um, I feel like libraries of information, mm -hmm. or like ex or like databases. Oh yeah, like the, all the research yeah, databases like the they use. Databases, yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, and that's actually one that I really wanted to talk about. But yes, the most valuable asset for Towson University is you all, the students. I mean, if there were none of you, like I mean, Towson University would probably seize operations in just a couple of days. You know, there you are like the most valuable asset uh, Towson University has. Anybody else want to take any other guesses? Yes. Yes. So um, yes. All the physical hardware, like the IT hardware. Yeah, because if somebody was to steal that, I mean, that's going to be really expensive to replace. Anybody else? Yes. And the professors? Professors, yeah. It's all the same thing, like students, professors. They run, you know, they're the human capital. If you've ever heard of, like, you know, HC, HCM. So that's uh, extremely valuable. Anybody else have anything? Yes. The library? Yes. You know, the, the books. All the computers, everything, equipment. 
Anybody else? Yes. Uh, the app handshake that Pastor knows through find a lot of more jobs. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a useful tool. Um, in terms of like an asset, I mean, Towson University can obviously like they could use a different website. Uh, so I don't know if it's something that I would consider an asset, but as far as students' perspective, it is definitely like a useful tool. Yes. The physical buildings, the physical buildings, like mm -hmm. you know, building itself. Oh yeah. So physical items too. Mm -hmm. So. With that being said, uh, with another like huge organizational asset is actually data itself. Um, and that is because data is an extremely powerful tool that can enable organizations to do things like deriving valuable insights. Uh, you know, it's like I mentioned here, it's unique to the specific organization that it belongs to. So what I mean by that is like, you know, if there was like two different retailers like Barnes and Nobles and Nordstrom, right? You know, Barnes and Nobles has their own sales data, uh, like. What do they call it? Nordstrom has their sales data as well, but like that sales data is unique to that specific organization because you know both of them sell two different things. So if like Barnes and Noble were to get a hold of like Nordstrom's sales data, it would almost be kind of useless. I mean, sure they could understand like some things, but for the most part, you know, it's data is unique to the specific organization that it belongs to. And so that actually kind of leads me to my second point. So if data is not properly taken care of, if it's not properly backed up, uh, secured. Uh, and if it's lost, then it's going to be extremely costly to, you know, basically reproduce it because it takes a lot of time, uh, and time is costly in any organization. So, you know, that's why data is extremely, uh, you know, managing of the data is a really important thing to do. And a central component of data management is uh, data quality. Uh, I'm going to cover this in the next slide, but basically, uh, there's a saying that goes like this: garbage in, garbage out. And you know, if the data itself is of poor quality, the output or the reports or whatever like, you know, thing you want to present, it's also going to reflect the poor data itself. So now the next thing is like, how exactly would you measure data quality then? So according to the DIMBOK, there's actually six critical data quality dimensions. So the first one is called completeness. Now the best way I can describe this is let's say if you have like an Excel spreadsheet that has a ton of missing information, like a lot of missing rows, a lot of like incomplete columns, incomplete headers. Uh, you would say that data is in, that whole data set's incomplete. There's a lot of missing fields, and you know that's problematic. You need to make sure the data itself is complete. Um, so that's the first one. Uh, number two is called uniqueness. Now, a good example of this is like let's say you have a database, right? Um, and you have two entries for a person named John Smith. So how would you know like these are the no, no, these are two different people or if they're duplicate records? Because um, another thing about like another thing about data quality is like you, duplicate records are also costly, and that uh, takes like extra space in databases uh, for storage costs. So making sure that like data is unique, there's not any like duplicates, is a big component of that. So going back to that example I was saying about like the two Mike Smiths, uh, if there was something like maybe like a Mike F Smith and a Mike J Smith. That's how you get a better idea, like, okay, these are two unique entities, uh, it's not the same person. So that's what I meant by uniqueness. Timeliness, uh, so this is another good example I'll explain. Uh, so let's say like, okay, so tomorrow would be Thursday, right? So if I was to give you like two different weather reports, uh, one from like 30 days ago, and just one from yesterday on like what Thursday's weather's gonna be, which one are you more inclined to believe or trust? Like, yeah, the one most recent, right? It's because the, the data that's used to uh, predict the weather is, uh, you know, more up-to-date. And that's basically like what is meant by timeliness. It's like the, it's the data as up-to-date as possible for me to, like, trust it. And speaking of trusting data, that's what these two, uh, validity and accuracy, really kind of have to do with, is can I, tr is the data trustworthy? Uh, can I, you know, use it to confidently, like, can I be confident in its uh, ability to, like, provide me with, like, exa exactly the results I'm looking for? And lastly, for consistency, uh, basically that's like saying that like if you have a company where there's like two different departments, like a payroll and HR, right? And they like payroll stores somebody's record as sixty-five thousand dollars a year, whereas uh, HR stores at a seventy thousand. So that's another data quality issue because that means data is not consistent uh, throughout the organization. So that's kind of what I mean by consistency. Uh, anybody have any questions on this particular slide, or need any further like elaboration? 
right? So in the previous slide, I talked about data, um, data quality, but another really central component of data management is managing metadata. Now, metadata, for those of you who don't know, is just data about data. Or more specifically, it kind of describes the data. And there's a really good slide after this that I'll um, kind of go over to give you a better example. Um, but another, I guess another good example of metadata is like, if you were to take an image on your phone, right? Uh, that you can see like specific information as to like when that picture was taken, uh, the file size, um, you know, like the location. That information is the metadata, and so that itself is also extremely like useful, like making sure like metadata is of good quality, because like I said, it tells a story behind the data, um, and like I mentioned here, it increases confidence in the data, it provides context, uh, and it just helps you enable the um, measurement of data quality. Yes. Oh. If the data was like mm -hmm. people, the metadata would be like the heights and age. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Yeah, so like height, age, uh, you know, gender, ethnicity. Good example. Yes. So you, you, mm -hmm. like the same person who like monitors or regularly does the same person or group manage the metadata? Uh, that's actually a really good question, and I'm actually going to cover that in like a later slide if you want. Uh, yeah. So, because there's different roles in the world of data governance. And each role does have a good kind of a specialty. So um, I'm gonna cover that in the next couple slides. Anybody else have any questions? So this is a really good picture I found online that just kind of gives you more information on like what metadata is. So that image of that jacket, that's just, that's the data, right? But all this information about like the date that was created, the file name, who the creator is, description, color, that's metadata. And so, the reason why metadata is, like, like I mentioned, super important is because it does give you more detailed context behind the data itself. Otherwise, you know, like you could just see this image, but like if you wanted to know like who made it or how old is it, you know, if that information is not tracked, then you wouldn't be able to do that. So ensuring that metadata is like, you know, met, like following those six quality dimensions is a huge component of data quality. And, um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, this picture is pretty straightforward, but I, yeah, anybody have any questions or um, on this? All right. So, poor data management can be extremely problematic. So, regarding the first bullet point over here, uh, remember how I earlier said like garbage in, garbage out. So, same thing. If your like data is of bad quality then like the output, the dashboards or reports that you want to make are going to also be poor. And this is going to be extremely like, this is really, really bad because like, let's say if you want to do like a presentation to like a high level executive, you know, like you're trying to make like a, a case, you know, you want to make like, trying to influence a decision at your company. And you know, like you didn't really do like spend much time on data quality and like you present some sort of dashboard or visual and like the executive like kind of points out the flaws and you can't defend it then that's, uh, you know, you're gonna lose a lot of reputation at your company, you might even get fired if it's that bad. If you're working in the field of consulting, and you know, you're trying to present to a client, and you can't defend like any errors that you see, you know, you probably lose the client, and you know, it's gonna be extremely costly, uh, is what I'm trying to say, is like, poor, decision, uh, poor data management. Uh, another, on the second bullet, so another thing that organizations absolutely don't wanna do is getting a lawsuit, and <laughs> so, like I said, if data, like there's a lot of different regulations out there, you know, for in the medical field, there's HIPAA, um, you know, the, in the educational sector, there's FERPA, but these things are just kind of short, like, you know, that like specific records to, like, for that industry, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't get like, it's not like, you can't just like give it to anybody. It's one of those things that's highly sensitive, highly protected. And if it's seen that like, you're not really protecting that sensitive data, then yeah, you can be very much, uh, you know, target of a lawsuit, which can also be extremely costly. Um, these last two bullets kind of have to do with more so cybersecurity, uh, but like I said, if your data is not being properly handled or stored, and some hacker were just to get a hold of it, it's just too easy for them, and you know they reveal or, or they leak all that sensitive data to the public, then you know as an organization you will lose your customers' trust, and as a brand you take an extreme reputational damage, and um, you know ultimately all this you know leads to financial losses, which you know is what companies don't want to do. They don't want to lose any more money. So, uh, yeah. Anybody have any questions on this slide? Yes. Do you know any organizations or companies that have like challenges with like data loss or security or digital assets? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of organizations do. Like, a lot of things actually, a lot of like, a lot of companies don't really implement like data governance or data management as effectively as they should, until like they realize like, oh man, something happened, and now we realize why this is. So uh, that's why it's actually a really great field because there's going to be like a lot of openings, a lot of needs for data management professionals. So, like I said, a lot of organizations are kind of catching up to this particular area. So I can't list all, all of them, but obviously, you know, it's a problem that I've seen so like so far. Anybody else have any questions? Yes. Yeah. So like I mentioned, like the slides about the data quality dimensions. So like there's six critical like factors you have to look into like you know if the data incomplete is it inconsistent are there, is there duplications <clears throat> you know those are specific data quality issues that you'll encounter um, when you're looking at like trying to improve data quality so um, you know those are just a few things to look out for but yep yes but so then like when you realize the data is bad do you throw it out or do you fix it <laughs> no you fix it yeah, never throw out data because there's obviously going to be good, like valuable stuff in there too. Just mm -hmm. it needs to be cleaned up. It's like you know when you need to clean your house, you don't burn it, right? <laughs> yes. Do you have to encrypt a lot of like the metadata to protect, uh, like protect you from like the company hackers and whatnot? Uh, yes, actually, that's a big part. Is um to kind of classify information as sensitive, as PII, even the metadata level. Okay. Yes. It depends on the organization. Obviously, like the things like you know, in the medical space, uh, they have their specific tools that can classify HIPAA data. The educational field, they can you know, things like FERPA, and uh, yeah, there's also like other regulations like GDPR. So it really depends on the organization, uh, what type of data they like deal with, and they'll um, you know apply the right like try to masking solution. Anybody else? All right. So yeah, up to this point, we've kind of covered uh, data quality and uh, why it can be problematic. But have no fear, because uh, that's where data governance comes in. But before we talk about data governance, I want to ask you all a question. So what's the point of governing? And I like more specifically, like why govern anything, you know? And when you think of governing, like the very basic definition, you know, it's like you put policies, uh, processes, controls on people, on businesses. So, you know, why? Like, what's the point of doing all that? Yes. Exactly. Uh, it's basically to prevent chaos. Uh, going back to the title of the slide, you want stability, you want control, you don't want any sort of chaos. And uh, just going back to the previous slide, this one here. Like all these, like these are just a few of the issues that I mentioned. Uh, there's obviously other like uh, issues that could come from poor data management, but all these are just this is chaos. You know, organizations don't want to like deal with this or you know like to a large level. So this is what data governance is really for: is to kind of put the right people, right policies in place to uh, yeah, basically have strong standards. And that's kind of what you know, I mentioned here. Data governance ensures that there's proper policies, processes to establish to guide effective data management. So one of the key things it does is that it tries to ensure standardization throughout the organization. So, you know, for example, there's a thing called business glossary term that you would make. And so this is kind of an interesting, contra, uh, interesting concept, but a business glossary term is basically like, let's say like, you know, you're like working with an HR like company, right? Uh, and for like somebody who's like applying to the company, there might be like different terms to describe that one person. You can describe them as like a talent, an applicant, or a candidate. And you know, you can always make the argument like, sure, those three things could be the same thing. But uh, you know, and you might think, okay, it's not a big deal, but it kind of is actually. Because a lot of different systems, they might have data that has like the name applicant name, or candidate name, talent name. Um, those are all obviously the same thing, but maybe like for reporting purposes, like the systems might not pick up on all of the key information. Um, or like all the relevant information, I should say, um, that has to do with like the applicant's information. So the solution to doing that is, um, to fixing this, is to create a business glossary term, which is basically just one term that has multiple definitions. And uh, so for example, you could just have somebody called a talent, 
and that definition would be the same as you know like an applicant or a candidate. So a business glossary term is just kind of there to like standardize the vocabulary used in an organization. Um, so that way, like when you do like a lot of reporting work, uh, you know you don't miss out on any like critical columns because of like you know it wasn't properly labeled um, with like another name. Uh, so that's like it, it ultimately ensure standardization. Also, data governance tries to establish accountability as well. And uh, one of the things I mentioned is that there's different roles in the world of data governance. Uh, for example, there's uh, somebody who could be called a data owner. So, you know, going back to that earlier image of that green jacket, right? I'll uh, go back here. So, you know, if, I know this is like an image file, but for the sake of uh, this lecture, let's just say this is like a spreadsheet, right? Like some sort of data set. Uh, so basically what happens is like if there's a, instead of a creator, it would show like, a data owner and so what this allows is that like in the organization setting so like nobody can just go in and like make any sort of changes to them unless they ask specifically toward uh, to the data owner get his permission and you know only the data owner can like, look at the request and just approve it if the request is valid so that's the thing like that's another thing that prevents chaos because otherwise people could just go in and just make any sort of modification to like a data set and that would be obviously very chaotic so that's kind of, in a nutshell, what a data owner will do. And I'll expand, there's more roles. I'll talk about those a little later. Okay. So I really like this, uh, this is another image I found online, and I really like it. It basically kind of compares uh, data management versus data governance. Uh, but more so, if it asks like, if data was water, then uh, data quality obviously would be concerned with uh, making sure the water is pure and doesn't get contaminated. Now, data governance, on the other hand, is more so to prove, like, or to establish people, like, put people in the pla right places uh, with the right tools to ensure, like, that water can be of good quality or data. So, um, yeah, and then, of course, on the left-hand side, I just took the proper, the full definition or um, that I got from Dimbach. Um, but, yeah, this slide kind of covers the differences between data management and data governance. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, Um, yeah, obviously, like it ensures like um, that people can get one of, like um, the valuable insights from data, uh, make sure that they can like get you know like the right insights and all that. Um, but only through proper governance, uh, making sure like the right people are put in place, the right tools. Ultimately, it is to uh, you know enable high quality uh, data quality. Yeah. Yes. What's the difference between like data governance and like data stewardship? I'm actually going to cover that on the next slide, but. Uh, yeah, I think I'll cover it. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you on the next slide. Good question, though. So, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, there's different roles in a data governance-driven organization. So, starting from the very top, you would have the Data Governance Council, or the DGC. And, yeah, like I said, they sit at the very top. And they like, they're consist of basically like the high-level executives, like the high-level data um, like data stewards, um, data like uh, we call um, stakeholders in the organization, and they're the ones who basically kind of guide how the organization is going to implement data governance throughout the organization. Uh, they're the like key decision makers, really. And then data stewards um, are actually responsible for like the management of data quality, but more so like they kind of take ownership of like a specific domain. Uh, so, for example, you can have like a data steward who takes who is like the owner of like PeopleSoft HR data. You can have another data steward who's like the owner of PeopleSoft financial data. And I guess a good analogy I like to use for you know, data stewards is like, if the data governance council is like the president of the country, uh, a data steward would be like the governor. They like govern each, uh, the governor governs like each state, right? Uh, the president can't do like, you know, govern the specifics of each state. So that's where uh, a data steward is. Like they're kind of specific, like they own a specific domain and they're focused on the data quality of that domain. Um, the data governance council can they, they can oversee the whole like overall organization, but they can't just you know govern each specific uh, system or domain out there. And then, as I mentioned, data owners, uh, like I said, they're responsible for like taking requests, make sure that, like people uh, like the requests are valid if somebody wanted to change anything, and um, you know they approve or they deny. So these are some of the roles. Anybody have any questions on this slide? All right.
Was that? Oh yeah, what's up? So I have a question about like uh, data quality. So how does data not get corrupted from other false data that's implemented into more data? Uh, that's where like, kind of where you have like measures in place to uh, prevent that from happening. Um, like I said, like a lot of it has to do with making sure like you don't just uh, ingest junk data. And there's a lot of like um, there's a lot of data governance tools out there that are kind of set up in a way that basically it evaluates data quality itself. It's like really smart and uh, high tech. But yeah, and then of course there's also like the different roles also like the data owners like I mentioned, uh, their job is also to make sure like a lot of the data quality, like the data being ingested is not gonna like mess up the whole data um, in the organization. So, hope that answers your question. All right, so uh, obviously, I think up to this point, you know, we've established that data governance is extremely beneficial for the whole organization. But with that being said, there are still some major challenges when it comes to implementing a data governance program. Uh, the biggest being this one here, getting that organizational buy-in. So what I mean by this is like, so from what I've like, like um, noticed in the world of data governance, uh, it is like a lot of grunt work almost like kind of underappreciated work uh, when you're basically in the work of data quality and data governance. Um, because like compared to like a traditional data analyst, you know, you're not making like really pretty dashboards that you can present to people and you know, capture their attention. You're just doing a lot of like behind the scenes data quality work, you know, cleaning up spreadsheets, uh, cleaning up databases, and creating policy documentation. So it's not as uh, like a pretty or sexy of a role, but uh, you know, it's something that does have a huge benefit in the organization. But even with that being said, I mean, a lot of people might not see the value of implementing the data governance program because they don't see it as like something that, you know, nets like a really like a nice, you know, what do you call it? It doesn't like get the attention like other uh, specific fields might. And um, also like that's the main thing, people are creatures of habit. So, you know, when it comes to like just implementing any sort of change, like data governance isn't just about like implementing a software or, you know, a tool or here and there. It really is like a whole like, attitude, it's an organizational shift. People have to kind of start changing the way they look at data. They have to look at, like, change the way they, um, you know, like, they interact with data and, like, the different people. They might have to wear, like, play a different role. And, you know, all these, like, the, you know, these things could be things that people just might not be willing to, like, adapt to. And uh, that's, that's why, you know, this is the biggest challenge of data governance is getting people to buy in, buy into the whole data governance program. Yes? So when you say it's very political, very much, yeah. And uh, that's the problem like with data, like I'll actually kind of cover this in the next slide too, but like there's a thing called data silos, where basically like you have different departments that each think a certain way, they all kind of think of data a certain way also. And the whole goal of data governance is to make sure that you can kind of break these different silos and uh, kind of get people all on the same page. So that's why it's really challenging. But I, you know, from what I've seen, like that's why you need strong leadership uh, who can communicate the right message. So obviously I told you about like how you know, poor data quality issues can lead to uh, you know, financial monetary loss. And so if you were like a leader in an organization, uh, sure, you know, nothing wrong with communicating that message to your employees, but you know, I think um, the whole concern about like money is more so, um, that's like higher level execs, like that's something for them to be more concerned about is like you know, how can we save more money. Uh, more so, like the message you really want to communicate is how like data governance is ultimately about future proofing uh, your company so that way like you don't get hit, get hit with lawsuits uh, people don't get fired or like you know there's all sorts of like chaos you know that's what it's ultimately the me right message you need to like leadership needs to communicate is that data governance is ultimately about making sure that your company is uh, future proofed uh, to handle any sort of challenges going forward so anybody have any questions on this slide yes Uh, yeah, actually I have so far. Uh, so when I worked in the, I worked as a data governance consultant, and that's kind of like why me and my team were brought on. It was kind of like, uh, like the data governance program over there was like full of like people arguing and like not really be on the same page. Uh, so that's kind of what we had to do as consultants is like kind of guide them, hold their hands, and uh, yeah, get them all on the same page, which is a lot, you know, harder, you know, it's really hard. <laughs> Getting people to adapt. I mean, technolo changing technology is easy, but let me tell you all, like, it's the people. The people are the hardest obstacle, like, when it comes to changing in any organization. Uh, so that's 
kind of my, my, my big takeaway is uh, the people are the biggest challenge. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Like uh, having to deal with somebody who's taking credit for somebody else's idea? Um, I don't think so. Nothing like too uh, political like that. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. So that's first uh, data governance challenge. Another question that really gets asked all the time is, okay, so like, sure, we'll go ahead and adapt a data governance program, but who should own the program? Should it be something that IT handles or should it be the business side? And I mean, like I'll, first off, I'll say that it depends on the organization. Obviously, you know, maybe one company's IT department's less mature than like their business side. Um, Cause there's a lot of business value in data governance. So ultimately it does depend on the organization, but it has to reside somewhere, obviously. Now, I'm gonna tell you guys all this right now. Like I don't like this question because uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but the whole goal of data governance is that it's like, it's a collaboration. Uh, it's like there's a bunch of different like islands in the organization and you're trying to get them all on the same page. So when you ask this question like, oh, should it reside in IT or business? You're kind of already saying that like, oh, okay, it's either IT's you know, problem or you know, business's problem. And that's the wrong mindset to have. It's a collaboration and you know, the whole goal is to get people on the same page, break up those islands or silos. Um, so that's kind of my take on this particular question. Anybody have any questions? All right. Now this last slide, uh, I love this because I think I have another really good like way to like kind of, um, just another good way to like kind of compare data governance. Um, and that is like, I very much think of it like football. So, you know, let's think of like the very basic, okay? You have the quarterback, right? And a lot of people would argue that the quarterback is like the most important position on the offense because you know, they're the ones who kind of drive the ball forward, they throw the ball to the receivers, they hand it off to the running back and just enable the team, the offense to score, right? And then you have the receivers, right? The receivers, uh, they're the ones who kind of, they're the ones who catch the passes and you know, like I said, move the ball forward and ultimately ensure they can score. And then of course, then lastly, you have the offensive line. Um, the offensive line, like I said, or compared to data governance, they like do a lot of dirty work. It's almost underappreciated, but look, if the offensive line is weak, then the quarterback is not gonna be able to like throw the, to the receiver and score, right? So that's kind of where I wanna compare this to data governance. So the quarterback, in this context, think of it as like the data-driven organization. And then the receivers are like the effective ways to use data. And then lastly, the offensive line is gonna be kind of like the, the data governance program. So if the data governance program is weak, um, then the, you know, data-driven organization won't be able to properly use the data that it wants to. And um, from a business standpoint, it won't stay competitive. It won't be able to like uh, stay afloat compared to its competitors. I guess uh, the defense probably represents like, the different data quality issues and um, sort of, like that kind of stuff. And if the data governance program is not like built up to like um, take, you know, handle that stuff, then it's you know the whole organization is going to struggle. So, uh, uh, anybody have any questions? Or I hope it was a good analogy. <laughs> All right, I think uh, that should do it. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Yeah, good question. So, um, like, in my like my, this, uh, my first job in data governance was this company called Allegis Group, uh, and it's like if you've heard of Aerotech or Tech Systems, Allegis is kind of like the parent company of those. So, for at Allegis, like basically going in there, like I had never worked in the field of data governance. I didn't even like really know much about data governance or what it was. So the way they really trained me was like, well, first thing what I did was like in the meetings, I would just kind of listen in and like try to like pay attention to like certain words that I've never heard before. So I heard people say things about like things called data lineage or democratization of data. I had you know never heard of these words, so like I would just write them down and just then Google it after the meeting, just kind of like understand like what people were talking about. And then also uh, there was a specific tool that we used, a data governance tool called in, um, Informatica. And so we had some like senior level people who uh, would train us on that software, uh, just like kind of understand like how to create a business glossary term, um, just the core features that we needed to do for our work. So, you know, this is all like, the software itself was like kind of provided to us. Uh, we had a license, so that was, 
and the training was taken care of by the uh, senior level employees. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good question. So um, my first job in the world of data was actually here at Taos University. Um, if you've heard of OTS, I worked as a student data analyst. So that was kind of like my first experience in the world of data, like not data governance, but just data analytics. And that was actually in the summer of 2019. So that was actually in person. And um, it was probably the last in-person like job I've ever had. Because <laughs> everything after that has been pretty much remote or hybrid. But um, yeah, I think, um, and like the data governance jobs I've had since, I mean, they've all been remote. And um, yeah, I think that's been, it's not been too bad. It's actually kind of like, I love it actually, because I can just, you know, work in your pajamas. And uh, yeah, it's relaxing. <laughs> yes. Do you ever find you have a very good data or overwhelming? It can be, definitely for sure. Um, but I think in like companies I've worked for, there's like, we've had really good teams that um, just, know how to like kind of break up, break things up and split responsibilities. So I've dealt with like really big data sets, but then I've, it's not for the, fortunately for the most part, I've never been like the only one person on it. So, I mean, just as long as you have a good team, it becomes very manageable. You have a question? Yes. <clears throat> how would you go about implementing data governance mm -hmm. on an organization or like reorganizing their data governance? Would you go through the council or um, how would that work? That's a really good question because, yeah, so you're asking like, if you're implementing a data governance program for the first time, right? Um, so it really depends, but for the most part, you kind of have to start like um, understanding like the organizations, like their, um, like what their key uh, goal is, like why do they want to implement a data governance program? What, like, is there any specific issues that they're having? You need to first understand like the, their problems and then you need to like, okay, like find out like, okay, which people in your organization are I guess the most involved and uh, I guess data, like just like day to day data, like responsibilities, you know, it could be like some manager, like uh, for some department uh, who's probably dealing with a lot of data, like on a daily basis. Maybe you could talk to that person and be like, hey, do you want to be like a data steward or a data owner? Um, so it's a slow process implementing any data governance program. I'll say this though, like never ever, like when you implement a data governance program, you don't want to just like start like enterprise wide. More so you want to kind of start small and just like try snowball Know, into like something larger um, because like I said getting buy-in is a huge like issue with data governance program so once you like kind of build something out uh, maybe you work with a few departments and they all see the value that you bring to them uh, then you kind of build your reputation in the organization and then like more people will be kind of intrigued and then uh, you know then you'll slowly build out your program from that point on yes Uh, so yeah, I mean obviously you definitely want to make sure like you can do everything into your power to prevent a breach uh, But if that does happen, I mean, you know, there's a whole bunch of like process and guidelines you have to go through Usually a lot of companies do uh, write this thing called a disaster recovery plan That basically kind of like outlines like okay, you know, this is what we do in this particular situation um, This is like how we uh, I guess try to recover uh, You know, like maybe there's a whole like PR section on like how we deal with media um, and in terms of data quality, I mean, that's the thing, like, you need to be on top of this stuff before it becomes an issue. And that's kind of why the whole, you know, people are realizing, like, oh, that's why we need to implement data governance now. Because, mm -hmm. yes. Are in charge of making sure the data is secure? Like, am I in charge of that? Uh, that's one of the many roles I play, but it's not, like, <laughs> the only thing. But as a data governance professional, you do have to do, like, a lot of uh, different roles and responsibilities. Yes. I would say honestly in the world of data governance, it's probably more important uh, because you know, like technical skills can be easily learned, but end of the day, like you're dealing with people, um, different kinds of personalities, uh, you know, people that it might not be like really easy to work with. Some people are, some people aren't. So, you know, like in my experience working in the world of consulting, like that's my biggest takeaways. Not so like much on the technology side, but to people. Uh, you kind of have to hold their hand sometimes. You realize that also like not everybody has like the best attitude for change. They kind of have like this glass half empty mindset. So you really kind of have to be like a cheerleader. You really have to like um, just kind of 
spread the whole positivity uh, and hold their hand. Uh, I say that a lot, but that's such an important skill to have actually in the world of tech. Uh, because not even just in the consult, not only the clients only, but even like in an organization, you might work with like a different department that's not like, that don't really see the value of data governance. So you kind of have to like sell yourself. So that's an extremely important skill to have. Yes. Um, so obviously it's gonna like keep growing as a field, but what do you see like any changes in the like field of data governance in the future? Yeah, um, so there's actually some things that I've worked on that haven't been covered in the DIMBOC. Uh, one of those is actually on API compliance, um, because with APIs, if you don't know what that is, like that's like a, a kind of a software that like allows you to connect to other applications, and so basically APIs do kind of reveal a lot of sensitive information. So there really isn't like a whole lot of work done in that like specific space of like how do we make sure like sensitive data doesn't get leaked, we make sure the right people get the right information. So that's one place. Another huge um, area that's not covered in the DIMBOK is cloud computing. Uh, cloud governance, that's another big area that's um, definitely gonna be like an important skill to have in the future. And um, just trying to think, oh yeah, AI, you know, with chat GPT. You know, like a lot of people say like one of the big issues is like it's very biased. And you know, a lot of that has to do with like the fact that it's being like fed uh, maybe biased data. So like it just goes back to garbage in, garbage out. So, anybody else? Yes. Uh, so you're talking about like the systems that help one of those systems fails, does it fall into humans to fix the data, or is there like backup systems? I mean, so definitely like for, um, yeah, there needs to be at least like some backup systems, like a backup plan. Um, but if you don't, you know, like have one in place, you're gonna like lose out on a lot of money. So these are all things that you have to kind of consider before like actually becomes an issue, which is why it's a challenging thing. But you know, it's, it's gonna save your company and keep you uh, employed. Uh, yes. Um, other than your IT, IT uh, degree, mm -hmm. did you have to take um, any other kind of certification related to data management before you uh, started this um, So before I worked in world data governance, I actually didn't have any sort of like data governance specific certifications. Um, I did have this one called the Google Data Analytics Coursera certification, but that was just more like kind of general data analytics. Didn't really talk about data governance, um, but just you know skills like. SQL databases, um, spreadsheets. Um, so that's one I would recommend. Um, but I'm just trying to think if, uh, n no, I think while I was uh, like another, I mean, just definitely learn about cloud computing. Uh, that's a field that's gonna be like, I, like everywhere I've worked, there's always been some sort of big project involving cloud. So if you can work, if you wanna work in data governance, um, there's a whole you know, cloud governance sector that does like have a lot of openings. Uh, so definitely learn about that. Yes. Do you, um, have you worked with like data management with AI before? With AI? No, I'm not. Yes. Um, so the previous slide you talked about AI, like just kind of going back to that, mm -hmm. and how we as humans need to be the right message, mm -hmm. and also about future proofing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me go back to that slide. So what I mean by future proofing is that like, you know, but when you implement a data governance program, you're gonna have to change a lot of information. You know, you're gonna probably have to rename like thousands of like table and table names, column names. Um, and like I said, that's because you wanna make sure that like um, doing by doing that, you can get the full value of your data so like nothing gets uh, missed out when you do reporting work. Uh, so like I said, going, another slide I covered a thing called business glossary. Um, and like I said, that's all because you wanna have one definition for, you know, like one word for uh, multiple definitions. So that way like a lot of systems pull the right information. So that way like your reports are fully accurate. And um, that's what kind of what I mean by future proofing is that if you want your company to be truly data driven, um, data governance is a big, component of doing so, it'll enable you to do just that. Um, so like I said, by data, like being data driven is that you really wanna be able to get the most value out of your data. And um, that's kind of what, you know, like you're basically communicating that like, okay, as of now, we're not getting as much value out of our data as we should, but this is how we, you know, going forward by implementing a data governance program, 
you know, we can create um, accountability, we can create like, uh, diff like standardization. And by doing all that, we can uh, you know, ensure that going forward, we can become a data-driven organization, get the value from the data that we want going forward. Um, and in terms of people that I've seen, um, I guess one of my IS managers, um, and my, one of my previous companies at Allegis, uh, he was a pretty good like communicator because he really wanted to be like whenever uh, like as an analyst, you know, you reach out to different departments, and you know you're trying to like sell them your data governance program. So my manager would actually kind of join in, and he would always be there to kind of answer any questions, any concerns or doubts that um, people would have. Um, and I really yeah. like that because I think he it really showed that he really wanted to kind of get buy-in from the different departments. So, yep. Yes. So what do you think? Uh, definitely just getting experience. I'll, like, it's funny, kind of funny because before getting my first data governance job, like I was working as like a just a uh, like an ERP business analyst. I wasn't really doing anything too technical, so uh, I think there was kind of a stroke of luck. But I think my previous experience working as a data analyst with OTS, even though it was like a student level, was very like kind of a, the work wasn't anything too like complex. But I think just having that on my resume kind of helped too. Just anything that can highlight that you like worked on data quality. Um, Cause like, even like when I was working at OTS, I had to do a lot of data cleanup. Um, so I made sure to emphasize that in my data governance interviews. Uh, I made sure like, I, I talked about how I, I had to enforce branding, uh, branding standards on our dashboards. Uh, and that's the same thing, it goes back to standardization. So um, I just try to relate my, like, as much of my job experience as I could to the data governance position. And I think, yeah, I, I got the first job. And then after, once you get the experience, like after over a year, then you, you know, you really kind of it becomes easier to find another job in that field. Uh, so just, yeah, try to work in any sort of space where you're working on data quality, data cleaning. Um, and you wanna work in data governance, just mention that. And uh, just make sure you read the job description as well. Understand it really like what it's asking or what it's like, or try to relate back to your work experience and how you can uh, kind of um, compare it to what the job's asking you. Yes? When did you apply this role, what was the first job? Uh, no, actually, I was, I kinda, I kinda got lucky. <laughs> Because prior to that, I was just working at my dad's business. So like, uh, it was a convenience store too, so that was absolutely like nothing technical. Um, just, I guess it was just a little luck. But just keep applying, I mean, and um, you know, that, like your interview is like the time for you to shine. Um, that's where you really wanna make sure you kind of communicate like all the stuff that you know, and that you like communicate, that you understand what the job description entails and that you're the you know, right person. Um, you know, like a good resume can only get you the interview. But uh, the, like, it's up to you really to like wow the you know hiring managers and uh, get the first job in the world of data. Yes. How does uh, data governance play a role in protecting like an online like an online person's data? Like, what do you mean like online? Like oh like online data like? Yeah. So like, mm -hmm. the, are there like policies and companies for the data governance mm -hmm. or like what they can collect? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So that's actually very much uh, a big component. Is like you, you need to make sure that you can um, what you call it, like collect the, like you have a, like a whole system documented on like what information you're collecting um, and more like it's called retention. Um, like if you like you need to kind of like out, like create a document that talks about like how you're gonna like kind of collect information, how you're gonna um, archive it or store it, and then most importantly how you're gonna like delete it or um, get rid of it. So that way like it doesn't just stay around and like somebody could get a hold of it. So that's just another thing that you know companies have to kind of create. Also, uh, think of think ahead. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, I have a I just want to say, uh, that was a great presentation. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Good question. Um, so there was actually some classes, I mean, I look back and, uh, you know, actually I mentioned very early, like, um, like with the final project for this class, um, that allowed me to do more research on the topic of data and data analytics. And um, I just, like, that kind of really helped me kind of become more confident in knowing that, like, okay, I want to work in data. Uh, it's such an interesting field, I love it. And um, yeah, that was for this class. Other classes that I found that I found really helpful were like project management, uh, which I think is a 400 level IS class with Dr. Hamill, that's a great class. Um, a lot of stuff I can always like think back to um, that I learned. Um, the information security class, or cybersecurity, I took that with um, Dr. Blair Taylor, 
So that's um, another good thing. Like that was the first time I learned a lot about like PII principles, like cybersecurity principles, like what PII data is, sensitive data. Uh, so there's just little like, I mean, I'm just thinking back. There's all these little bits and pieces um, from the classwork that I found really helpful in my like career. Um, but in terms of like, you know, really, it's all about internship and work experience that kind of trumps um, book knowledge. Not that there's anything wrong with it. It's good to have, but uh, you know, having that experience under your belt. That's kind of what you really need to like focus on if I were all you. Um, any sort of like internship, volunteering, you know, even like it's like for political, like you can do stuff like um, political volunteering where you like collect data and um, do like just sort of like analysis, simple analysis work for free. Um, just try to get as much experience on your resume as you can. Um, that's my like my yeah my advice for you as you know students taking this two hundred level class. Anybody else? There's a so there's a generational mm -hmm. there may be a generational difference mm -hmm. from say baby boomers to generation today. Mm -hmm. Just say like how many how frequently are you seeing folks within your age group mm -hmm. change jobs? And and I mean change jobs and or contracts and do it rather successfully. Mm -hmm. And what's the driver for the change? No, that's a really good question, and I've thought about this myself. Um, so, like, I'm uh, 29 years old, right? I'm, I like to think I'm like the last of the millennials, and <laughs> and you know, growing up, like, I was, I, I remember pretty vividly, like, the whole 2008, 2007, like, recession when that was happening, and I remember a lot of students, like, you know, or a lot of like my uh, friends in school, like, um, you know, they would like, they, a lot of them would be moving, and like, you know, you saw like visibly, like, the what do you call, a lot of like. You know, parents like they got fired from the jobs that they've been holding for like many years, and I think you know for my generation and even like younger, like there's sort of like this, um, I guess sort of like this distrust of corporations. Like you know, like corporations aren't like as loyal as they say they are. So you know, with that in mind, um, a lot of people have kind of discovered a hack, myself included, that like you know you don't really have to stay at a place for like three plus years. It's perfectly fine to like get like at least one two years experience and then just jump to another company. And I found that doing so has actually been kind of helpful because had I not done it, like job hopping, I would have actually never been in the, like, never got my first data governance job. Um, I worked at that you know, consulting company, my first job out of college for a little over a year. And then I decided to make the jump in the world of data governance. And that's where I realized like, you know, this is, I, I like this uh, particular space. And it's good to take risk when you're younger. Um, so definitely like, I would say when you're like, when you graduate, you know, don't be afraid to like, if you don't like your company <coughs> too much, you know, don't be afraid to jump. Um, I think it's, um, what do you call it? Like, that's where like, I guess what Jones was saying. Uh, with boomers, I mean, like they really did grow up in a different time where like they really, I mean, it's almost kind of unfair because they kind of grew up with like college tuition being really dirt cheap. And uh, yeah, they could like pay their college tuition with like their summer job at McDonald's. You know, we don't have that privilege anymore. Everything is ridiculously expensive. <clears throat> so, you know, another thing with job hopping is that you do kind of ensure that your salary gets, you know, you get a higher increase in salary compared to if you stay at your company for like two, three years. Because that's actually one thing I noticed is like, some companies they only give like five, six percent annual raise. Uh, whereas if you job hop, you can get like up to anywhere from like 30 to 50%. Uh, so not some, like, you know, I'm kind of encouraging it, but like just make sure you do it carefully. <laughs> uh, but I think, yeah, just going back to our gener like younger generations, it's um, that's kind of one thing is like, I feel like, I feel like a lot of younger people are like more inclined to leave a company faster than like older generations. And I think maybe just growing up in like these bad economic times, the recession with COVID, you know, we kind of just don't really trust corporations. Uh, we can just, when they say like things like, oh, we're a family, you know, we can just mail the BS. <laughs> so. Here, another point we talked about last week, brother, was, mm -hmm. so we have like software as a service and all mm -hmm. of these different acronyms and stuff. Mm -hmm. But what, what we've noticed in terms of like trend analysis mm -hmm. by looking at data is data is product. Yeah. Um, and to your point, you know, I, I wrote it. I wrote it down in my phone. Mm -hmm. You know, it, but it made me think of this in terms of data unlocks the secret of what we see on the surface. Mm -hmm. And if and if you're really great at it, I wrote data tells a story. Yeah. So um, not not next week we're on spring break, mm -hmm. not the week following, but we're talking about knowledge management. But mm -hmm. the week after that, we're actually looking at data visualization. Yep. And to your point, mm -hmm. um, I wrote down. From a future proof in your organization establishing a data value chain mm -hmm. 
And that makes me think about how often you as like a data governance or a data management expert mm -hmm. have to actually produce products that are visual. And just as a, you know, like I shared um, for a contract client that I had mm -hmm. in terms of like a workflow. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, what type of products do you normally have to produce within your type of space? And would you say like the college degree was kind of overrated to be <laughs> able to produce it? Or with just a little bit of passion, gumption, mm -hmm. you'd be able to produce those products? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I'll say this, like, a lot of once you like get in the workforce like I mean having like that like I said book knowledge is good but ultimately it's that experience that really a lot of employers value and in terms of like making like data products so in the field of data governance uh, you're not really kind of you're not really making like many dashboards as compared to like a traditional data analyst um, I have but it wasn't like a like I've made simple dashboards in our tool called Informatica but it wasn't really like the interactive types like the really pretty visuals it was more like just like static information that kind of captures uh, information about like data warehouse metrics that like another department was using. Uh, previously, that department was actually storing those metrics on a spreadsheet. So basically, what my like one project that I worked on was like we had to bring those metrics from the spreadsheet into our data governance tool. And the reason that was beneficial is because now that made uh, basically it's easier to access the data governance tool. Like there was a basic web user view. So you know you don't have to like ask the specific department for that spreadsheet anymore. You can just go into that tool. Uh, it's all online, and you know you can see the metrics right then and there. So by doing so, you made data more consumable, uh, enterprise wide. So that's um, not like like I said, it's not a pretty visual dashboard, but it's still like it's something that you can tell, you can show um, you know, to other departments. Like this is the value we're bringing as data governance professionals. Hey, Perla, how did you know like the the private sector? Like, why not, obviously, you know, like government has a ton of, or utilizes a ton of data consumption, mm -hmm. but what made you not, or what made you choose the path that you're on now instead of getting a, a job at the bank? <laughs> uh, good question. I mean, I just, uh, it's kind of how life has worked out for me. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, when I graduated college, I had no idea what data governance was. I had no idea I'd be working in data governance. But uh, you know, I think just taking a risk, um, trying to see what's out there, and really understanding what you're passionate about, and trying to find positions that kind of match that. Like that's kind of what enables you to like um, just kind of get on your you know journey. Like life isn't like a you know it's not a straight and narrow road. It's like kind of up and down. It's like all sorts of like twists and turns. Um, so just kind of my advice for y'all is just embrace the you know the chaos. Because <laughs> life is not predictable, so just, yeah. That was all I had. Um, <laughs> I would ask if you can, um, like, hang out for a little bit. Yeah. Um, so they already know, like, this was this was essentially it. Like, I'm not lecturing after you because I already knew you'd be a hard act to follow. <laughs> so I really want them, for those who are interested, to take some time, mm -hmm. you know, get to know you a little bit, especially why you chose Georgetown. <laughs> um, but more importantly, you know, just to see, you know, familiar face, network, and yep. whatnot. Uh, I'm going to hang out, too, for a little bit. Next week, spring break, be safe. Make, make good choices. Right? Make good choices. Come back in better condition than how you leave. And then when we do come back, knowledge management will be on the table in preparation for data visualization discussion. So just hang out with Brother Safe for a little bit. Um, you know, pick his ear, pick his brain.